Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us um, today. My name is Delia O'Brien, and I'm the Sheep and Goat Specialist at Virginia State University. The objective of this seminar series um, is to provide aspiring, new, and experienced small ruminant producers with knowledge needed to, to be more successful or to increase your comfort level. Um, with with raising sheep and goats. Um, We've got the Winter Warrior Soldiers Award. If everyone could, um, yeah, please mute. Mute themselves, please. Um, yeah, so we're hoping that everyone will walk away with, with um, something new from these webinar series. They'll be held every third Thursday of the month until the end of the year. Um, or first topic is pesky worms. And you should see on the screen all of the topics for each month. And you just have to go to each month and register for each individual. Um, a lot of thought went into choosing these topics. We thought that these would be the most beneficial um, for our producers in the mid-Atlantic area. and. Um, so we're hoping that you all will join us for every single um, webinar this year. Um, as I mentioned, today's topic is pesky worms and our speaker is Dr. Kwame Matthews. He is from Delaware State University where he's the chair of the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources. He's also the small ruminant extension specialist and researcher um, at Delaware State. So he has his hands pretty full um, he has a PhD from Tuskegee University in molecular um, parasitology, and his research interests lie in um, low input small ruminant production, as well as applied and basic research into novel methods of parasite control. So again, um, I'm going to ask folks that if you have questions throughout the, his talk, um, throughout Dr. Matthew's talk, if you could please put it in the chat. And we will have about 15 minutes at the end, 15, 20 minutes. And I'll ask him um, those questions on your behalf and he'll answer them. If I can, I'll go ahead and answer some of those questions um, in the chat when they pop up. Um, but yeah, I hope you'll enjoy tonight's um, talk. And we'll just go ahead and get started. Dr. Matthews, you can go ahead and share your screen. Let me stop mine. Good evening, everyone. So um, can you see the screen clearly? All right. Yes, so, I see your screen. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. O'Brien, for that introduction. So as Dr. O'Brien said, my name is Kwame Matthews and I'm at Delaware State University. So tonight we're talking about pesky parasites and um, pesky parasites is the best word to use because of the idea that these parasites are problematic and some of these parasites cause damage to your animals and a loss in funds because you got to spend money to take care of the parasites, to kill the parasites, or to control parasites in the best way possible. So with parasites, what we find is that most of the time people talk about parasitism, they're just looking at it from internal parasites. But what you have to understand is that you have both internal and external parasites. So sheep and goats around the world is impacted <laughs> significantly so sheep and goat um there's a wide range of parasites whether internal or external parasites that causes complication and most of the time what happened is why we would say there are parasites is because these organisms are going to cause the host to um, lose benefits of nutrients and therefore is going to cause damage to the host. So if it's sheep or goat, some of these parasites are going to impact their um, ability to digest nutrients or to get nutrients from their food. Some of the parasites will take blood. 
But whatever it is, these parasites are going to cause damage to the, the horse, so the sheep or the goat. The internal parasites are most problematic um, for all the sheep and goat production systems. And the reason for that is because the organisms live inside the body and most organisms that live inside the body is going to take away adequate amount of nutrients that is going to cause the animal to die. So the animal can die at a later time. Normally, when it's just infected, the animals don't die. But over time, these, uh, these parasites will kill the animal. The most problematic of all these parasites, internal parasites, is the barber pole worm. The barber pole worm is most problematic because it sucks blood from the abomasum of the animal, while you have the tapeworm, that is not a significant problem unless there's a lot in the animal. If there's a lot of tapeworm inside the animal, then it causes blockage. However, if there's not a lot, then the animal will pass out the dead pieces. Then you have coccidia, which is one parasite that is um, going to impact the nutrient uptake as it, as it rips away the walls of the small intestine. Now, the external parasites are those parasites that you find on the outside of the animal. So basically what you're finding is ticks, fleas, mites, and so on. With the external parasites, a lot of the available um, control methods or control drugs actually work to kill these parasites. While with the internal parasites, they're becoming more resistant to the drugs that are available. Now, <clears throat> the parasites that we have for sheep, goats, camelids, um, that are internal parasites can be divided into two major areas. You have helminths and you have protozoa. Under the, eight, the area of helminths, helminths can be divided into three different types of parasites. You have nematodes, cestodes, and trematodes. Nematodes are considered roundworms. So these worms right here, so these worms right here are considered nematodes. So what you'll have is that these are nematodes. Then you'll have cestodes, which are tapered worms. Um, they're more of a flat type of worm, um, and they can tear off when they're break, they break off easily. So parts of the body breaks off, especially when they're dead. And then you have um, trematodes, which are flukes. These are more of a genuinely flat worm that um, are flat parasite that is going to impact the animal in wet areas. Then you have protozoa. So protozoa are single cellular parasites. Um, not like coccidia is the most common protozoa that impact sheep and goat, and coccidia normally causes diarrhea, and it, it causes the small intestine to not be able to uptake nutrients. So absorption is prevented because of the small intestine. Now, you have most of these parasites that are problematic are normally gastrointestinal nematodes. So those are the ones that live inside the gut of the animal. Um, they're inside the intestinal walls. And most of the time, those will be most impactful because those are the ones that literally take away nutrients or cause a prevention of nutrient absorption. If you have high worm burdens, that is when they're most problematic. So the more worm, the more problem that you're going to have you're going to increase your um, signs and what will eventually happen, your animal can lead to death. Now, one of the parasites that we're talking about or we mentioned earlier is the tapeworm. Tapeworm is also known as monesia. And with tapeworm, as I said before, tapeworm is not as problematic in some animals versus others and most of the time with tapeworm, what you find is that there have to be a significant amount of tapeworm that is going to block the large intestine 
And then once it blocks the large intestine, then that causes more of a gut problem. And for, for the animal to pass out feces, it's clogged up. So the tapeworm can get very big. Here in this image, what you're looking at is a piece of tapeworm that is out in the feces. Normally, what happens is that the tapeworm is going to come out in feces when it's dead. So a piece, and if you look at it, you can see that it is segmented. So tapeworms are segmented worms and normally comes out in feces. You normally see a piece of it in the feces. You do see eggs in the feces sometimes, but you'll see if it's heavily infested, you'll see it coming out as pieces in the feces. Now, this worm lives in the small intestine, and in order for the animal to be infected, the animal must um, encounter an intermediate host. So the tapeworm is normally, eggs are normally passed on through mites. And then once those mites pass on the tapeworm, that is when the tapeworm is going to um, become an impact. Once it blocks the GI tract, so the gastrointestinal tract, then it becomes problematic. However, treatments are um, available. So the, the dewormers, such as like Safeguard or Valbazin, are normally very effective against tapeworm. So there is no resistance found yet. And therefore, once you identify it, you can give your animals Safeguard or Valbazin to treat it. Now, if there's no problem, there's no reason to treat. If you don't see any issue with the animal, there's no reason to treat um, for tapeworm because not every animal is going to have a heavy load of tapeworm. Then you have lungworm. Lungworm is one that can be problematic. Um, lungworm may either be indirect or direct life cycle. Um, when we talk about lungworm, there are three different species of lungworm that can impact sheep or goats. Normally, sheep is going to have more of an issue with the lungworm than even our goats that we've seen. Um, with the lungworm, what happens with the, in, with the direct life cycle is where, even though it is said that fe the, the parasite is passed on in its feces, what happens is that when, when an animal has lungworm, the animal that is coughing is going to cough up off their lungs the eggs of the worm, and then they're going to swallow those eggs back. They swallow the eggs back and the eggs go in their digestive system. Once the egg goes into their digestive system, that is when the eggs are actually passed out in their gastrointestinal system and they go into the fecal matter where animals that are grazing will collect, will eat the fecal samples or eat the grass samples that the, fe the parasite is on and then that parasite comes back into their system. So that is how the lungworm is really transmitted. Um, even though it is transmitted in the feces, what you realize is that the animal have to cough it up first before it can go in the digestive tract. So it stays in the lung. Um, when it's the animal is severely um, infected, what you're going to realize is that a severely infected animal is going to have a lot of fluid on their lung. They're going to be coughing a lot. And a lot of times what will happen is that they'll have pneumonia. And if um, symptoms persist, what's going to happen is that these animals can die um, because of respiratory issues. A lot of times they, people won't diagnose um, lungworm while the animal is alive. Normally they see it during necropsy. So when they do a necropsy on the animal, they'll find the parasites within the um, lung, and that is when they'll tell the farmers that they had it. A lot of times, what will happen once a farmer realizes that it's there and notice that it's common in his, on his or her farm, then what will happen is that these farmers will utilize dewormers. So most of the dewormers that are available to treat other worms are actually effective in controlling lungworm. So lungworm, the dewormer is working, not a big of a problem, 
as we would say when we get to Hemonchus contortus. Now, another parasite, parasite that's a, a big problem is the meningeal worm. This is a brain worm. This is a deer brain worm that is found in white-tailed deers. The white-tailed deer normally is, its, is the common host for this parasite. And so in a deer, it is not as severely if, um, impactful as when it's in um, sheep or goats or other animals. So when it impacts small ruminants, because of it being an unnatural host, what happens is that the animal will die very quickly. If it's not caught early, then the animal will end up dying. Now, with this, this requires an intermediate host. So in order for this parasite to be spread, what will have to happen is that um, they have to get into snails. So the parasite will borrow into snails or slugs and then once the animal is grazing, will consume an in, um, infected snail, which is then going to go into its body. Once it ingests the larva, what will happen is that the larva will actually start going through the spinal cord. So it starts moving from the intestinal tract to the spinal cord. Once it gets to the spinal cord, it can cause um, necrosis to start happening. And once it causes necrosis to start happening, that is when you start seeing impacts on your animal. So your animals start becoming a little bit lame. Um, your animals start having abnormal gait. But while it is moving to the brain, it is continually causing necrosis. And once it causes necrosis in the brain, that is when the impacts become very severe. And that is when um, things get progressively worse. So the closer it gets to the brain, the more it gets worse. And then the hindquarters will stop working. The animal will become paralyzed and then the animal can die. Now, if you cut open a goat or a um, sheep, what you will find in their brain is not going to be an adult parasite. What you'll find is the larvae. So you'll find the larvae of the parasite. If you should cut open a, a sheep or a goat's head and look in their brain, you'll find the larvae. But in the adult deer, you'll find the actual worm. So the worm can live in the adult deer and not be of a severe problem compared to when it's in um, the sheep or the goat. So once it gets into the sheep or the goat, that is when it is most problematic. Now, with this, sometimes you'll see that the animal is going to maintain its appetite. And so you're not realizing until it's a little bit too late. Um, when the animal starts becoming lame, you'll notice that it's becoming lame. And that is when you're going to have to start looking at if this parasite is the problem. And with this, you can always try to treat. Normally, you'll treat with safeguard. So safeguard is the drug of choice. And what you treat is five days. You'll have to treat it five days. And what you do is you use a high dosage of this antelmintic to treat with the, um, for the deer worm. Um, another thing is to prevent it, what you'll have to do is try to keep your animals away from wet areas. So you can keep them away from wet areas of the fence, where you, especially when you have a high deer population. You want to keep them from wet areas if the deer are going there to drink or if the deers are normally hanging around the water in, in your field, in your area, like say you have a pond in your field or you have any waterways close to your field. You want to make sure you're keeping them away from it. Um, then you want to restrict areas to... Um, the deer, if you can, you can keep out as much deer as possible. And then you can control the snail or slug population within the, the waterways area. So you don't want to have the animals um, in areas that may be problematic and cause more of a spread of this parasite. Now you have Telodosarja circumcincta. 
which is also known as the brown, brown um, stomach worm. The brown stomach worm is one of those worms that is also found in the abomasum of the animal. And it is more impactful when it's cooler and wet. So in the hot, wet areas, it's not normally the most um, common parasite, but in areas where the environmental conditions are wet and cooler, this parasite tend to thrive more. Um, the parasite, normally it gets into the stomach similar to all the other um, strong oil parasites where they get in by consumption of grass. And when you consume grass, you'll get in a third stage parasite and that parasite develop over time inside the body. What you find is that once the parasite is consumed, then this parasite will go into the abomasum of the, the animal, which the abomasum is the um is is what we would call the true stomach of the animal. So the abomasum is where all the nutrients are broken down to an extent. Um, this is where you'll find more acids helping to break down proteins. You'll find enzymes to break down the proteins and so on. And therefore, what will happen is that these parasites will borrow into the wall of the abomasum. And, and once it gets into the wall of the abomasum, any nutrients that is moving within the mucus of within the abomasum, this parasite is going to take the nutrients out of that mucus. Now, when they take the nutrients out of this mucus, what will happen is that the animal is removing mucus from the, from, or the parasite is removing the nutrients that the animal would normally use. This will cause some level of digestion disturbance because there's not enough mucus to help with some of the mastication process and some of the movement process of the nutrients. And then there is not enough nutrients being absorbed in the body. So that is why this becomes problematic. If you look at the image here, you see that there are nodules. So you see these nodules that are formed on the um, abomasum. This is where the parasite would be. It would form these nodules where it can live on the, um, in the lining. And in the lining, it's taking away the nutrients as it moves on. Now, this parasite is most problematic when it is um, mixed with another parasite. And the other parasite that it is mixed with is normally the trichostrangulus, um, trichostrangulus parasite. When both of these parasites are inside the body, this is when they're most effective. You don't even need Hemonchus to be there once these two parasites, the trichostrangulus, which is known as either the here or the bankrupt worm. These are when both the trichostrangulus and the um, telodosarja is, a, is um, working, then they become detrimental and can cause death in your animals. Normally, telodosarja, just like the other um, trichostrangulus, is going to cause weight loss. Um, it's going to cause the animal to lose appetite. So the animal is not going to want to eat. Um, the animal is going to lose protein and then it will lead to like decreased milk production, decreased um, wool production. And in serious cases, again, you'll see death. By itself, normally it will have to be severely infested for the animal to die. But if it is infested with trichostrangulus as well as this telodosarja, what is going to happen is that the animal can die easier. Part of the problem is there are two different species of trichostrangulus. One is known as the here, here worm, and the other one is known as the bankrupt worm. The here worm is the trichostrangulus oxide, and that is because it is very small and look like a here particle. And what happens is that this one lives in the abomasum. While you have the trichostrangulus colubriformis, which is known as the bankrupt worm, which that one is gonna live in the small intestine. That one does that one borrows into the small intestinal walls as well. And it does the exact same thing as the um, telodosarja, which is it, what it does is 
take away the nutrients from the mucus. When it's taking away the nutrients from the mucus, what is happening, the new, there's no nutrients being absorbed. This is why when both parasites are in the animal, it becomes very problematic because what is going to happen now is that the animal is going to start having diarrhea because the small intestine is impacted. The animal may become lethargic. In cases where it is even severe, sometimes what happens is that the lethargy actually leads to the animal um, falling over. So the animal becoming unconscious or the animal um, dying because of lethargy, scouring, and dehydration. So all of those become one big problem that the animal is going to go through. The Trichostrangulus colubriformis is the second most important worm that impact the digestive tract of um, sheep and goats. Um, the number one is the Hemonchus contortus, also known as the barber pole worm, which we'll cover. Um, but this parasite, again, normally found in cooler temperatures. That does not mean that it's never found in um, the Southeast. It, that doesn't mean that it's never found in the Eastern side of the US or the Southern parts of the United States. What that means is it, it's more common when it's colder. So it's going to be found in cooler areas more often. But once the temperatures start going down, this is the parasite that becomes more problematic. Um, what it, when it damages the gut, nine times out of 10, anything that damages the small intestine, what you end up with is the um, parasite preventing the animal from um, absorbing nutrients. When the animal absorbs nutrients, that is because that animal um, uses the small intestine to absorb nutrients from all the food that it's eating. And if the animal is not able to absor absorb these nutrients, then the animal is going to die. Now, the problem, the, the most problematic of all these parasites is the Hemonchus contortus. Um, this parasite is most problematic because no matter how much the goat industry is booming, what you find is that the barber pole worm, because of its blood sucking nature and it living in the abomasum, this parasite causes the most loss worldwide in production. It is a, considered a strangled parasite and it causes severe setback to the economic production of all small ruminants. Um, a lot of farms have this problem, whether you're in the United States or you're not in the United States. This is a problem because it thrives best in warm climates. So it thrives best when it is warm and when it has some moisture, um, this parasite will be problematic. It is a blood sucking parasite. And as a blood sucking parasite, what happens is that it causes anemia. So the animal can become anemic. Um, as in, that is why we do, we look at their mucous membranes, as this image is showing you looking at the inner eyelid. That is why we look at the mucous membrane because it is sucking away the blood and utilizing the red blood cells, which is going to um, limit the amount of red blood cell that the animal has and causes anemia. Now, with this parasite, it is problematic. Its biggest problem is that it lays so many eggs. When it lays so many eggs, you can't really, you can try to control as much as you possibly can, but you have to follow all the regulations in controlling. But it, it is very prolific. And because it is prolific, what is going to happen is that it will have millions, if not billions, of par um, parasite eggs on the pasture. Now, the parasite causes bottle jaw, and bottle jaw is caused because of the um, removal of proteins and the buildup of fluids under the jaw. So that bottle jaw is a lack of fluid that is a lot of a lot of fluid because of it not being able to utilize properly. 
um, when the nutrients are, are taken away. Now, in some cases, you'll have sudden death. And a lot of times when you have sudden death is when an animal consumes a significant amount of adult or parasite and they become adult in a in a um short window. When they become an adult in a short window of time, a lot of times you lead to sudden death because that animal is new to the parasite and then it is heavily infested by the parasite causing the animal to die. It loses a lot of blood immediately and does not know how to cope in order to survive for a little period for you to treat it. And most of these parasites, again, will cause weight loss, um, low body condition, and in, in cases, you'll have um, anorexia. Now, parasite life cycle is important, you know? And the reason why the parasite life cycle is important is because if you know the parasite life cycle, you can help with managing your herd in order to prevent some of the severe impacts of this parasite. What will happen is that you have adult worms, which is inside the animal. The adult worms lay about five to 10,000 eggs um, on a daily basis. So the adult female, when they lay those five to 10,000 eggs on a daily basis, those eggs are caught in the fecal because it goes through the intestine and it goes to the large intestine where it's going to come out in fecal matter. Once it comes out in fecal matter, the fecal matter is going to be put on grass. And once the fecal matter is on grass, what will happen is that the eggs inside the feces will start hatching. While it is in the, in the um, feces, the egg will hatch. So it will leave from um, an egg stage where it start coming together as an L1 stage. So the first stage of the larvae, and it will still be in the egg. Um, and then by the time it becomes an L2, um, it starts moving around. You can see it sometime in the egg moving around. And then a L3 borrows outside the egg. So it comes out of the eggshell um, and then it can move on grass. So the thing with this is the L3 parasite is going to go on the blades of grass. It's going to go on the lowest part of the grass first. And then as dew goes on the plant, what will happen is that the parasite moves up and down the blades of grass in water. So in water film or dew, and then that is how it is consumed. So it is consumed by the grazing animal once it's on the grass. And once it is consumed, then it goes back into the, into the animal where it starts excheating. The thing with it is the L3 stage is the toughest stage of the parasite because it has a sheath over the parasite that causes it to not die immediately when it comes in contact with sunlight or harsh weather conditions. So the parasite is going to stay there inside the sheet. All the nutrients that the parasite needs is going to be inside that sheet with it. And then what is going to happen is that it's going to consume the nutrients within the sheet before it is consumed. When the animal is consumed by, or the parasite is consumed by the animal, it excretes its first sheathing while going through the digestive tract to become an L4 parasite. The L4 parasite at that point can start to eat. It can start getting blood, but it, its specule, which it used to cut the abomasum, is very small. And, it, and so it doesn't eat as much blood as when it gets to an L5 or an adult stage, where that is when it consumes the majority of the blood. Now, the development of the worm um, occurred normally anywhere from 50 to 96 degrees Fahrenheit. So it got to be hot outside. It got to be warm. The temperature must have, um, it, the temperature plays a significant role with this because if it is warm outside, then the parasite will survive. A lot of times, um, what you realize with this too is that if the, if the temperature is somewhere between 65 and 85 degrees, 
then it takes about seven days um, for the animal to actually fully develop into where it is moving out of the uh, um out of the egg and into uh the, the into the, the adult stage. So however, the minimal time that this can take is three to four days. The average time normal would be seven to ten, but in warm conditions, conditions that are very conducive, then it goes through this process very rapidly. When it goes through this rapid um, process rapidly, what you find is that the animals are going to consume it on a regular basis while they're on the field. So in times like now when it's June, July, um, actually starting from May, um, you'll find that there's a lot more of the parasite being produced and a lot more of the parasite that is going to the infective L3 stage because the temperature is warm. And if it's raining, that's even more important because then it is moist enough for the eggs to feel comfortable and for the, the, the conditions to be right for the eggs to hatch. If it is hot, but it's dry, then the eggs don't hatch the same way as when it's moist. So that is a difference. Now, it excretes um, their cuticle. Hold on, some, somebody is not muted. So it exceeds their cuticle. Um, and normally once it exceeds the cuticle while it's in the room and it's moving through the gas, um, gastric pits and get to the abomasum. Again, it's at the L4 stage. Once it's at the L4 stage, then what will happen is a lancelet will form. The lancelet is what is um, known in, is in their oral cavity. And what they do is cut the abomasum. So a lot of times we talk about them sucking blood, but they don't necessarily um, like other species of parasite that put their um, um, lancet in and suck the blood through it. They don't, they don't do that. What they do is they cut the abomasum. So they make small nicks in the abomasum and then they drink the blood that comes out of it. So... What will happen is that once they're cutting these blood vessels, they're going to consume the blood. And the blood that is consumed from the animal is going to lead to anemia. Remember, as I said earlier, one parasite can lay up to 10,000 eggs. So if you think about it, one parasite is laying up to 10,000 eggs. The probability of that being um, where most of those hatches they're going to hatch the animal that is eating and eating the blades of grass can always have like 5,000 um, mothers inside of it. So if it has 5,000 mothers inside of it, then you know that it's going to be drinking a significant amount of blood. And if it's drinking a significant amount of blood, then that is when it becomes problematic for the animal. So the animal is getting severe blood loss. Now, larval migration and forage is affected by temperature, as I said. It's affected by the soil moisture and then humidity. So if it is not humid, if it is, doesn't have any moisture, if it is just dry and um, there is no moisture in the soil, a lot of times the eggs won't hatch readily. And if the eggs do hatch, the parasite can die in the field. Um, the parasite can die. It's not that it dies all the time. It dies a little bit more rapid because it doesn't have the adequate moisture to grow. It doesn't have the moisture to move up and down the blades of grass. And then it is going to have the, the, the parasite utilize all the reserves in the, cute, in the sheath a lot, a lot faster. So if the, the reserves in the sheath is not um, if the animal, is, if the parasite is not in the ideal environment, it is going to consume whatever reserves it have very rapidly and then die. Now, the larvae can migrate up about six inches when it's only moisture. However, if there is more than moisture, if there is fecal matter, say there is larvae, there is fecal matter on there and the fecal matter is a lot heavier. It can go all the way up 
so it can go more than the, the six inches, what you might end up find is that the parasite is going to go up about 12 inches. So in some cases, it is higher than what you're thinking because of the fecal matter that's on there. And if there are clumps of fecal matter, it can go up about six inches above the fecal or more than that, up to about 12 inches on the blades of grass. And again, remember it's using water par particles to move up. Then what you wanna do is maintain your posture. So if you're not maintaining posture properly, then you can't really control how much the parasite is impacting your animals. But you wanna maintain your posture um, in the adequate way to limit the amount of parasite that is going on. Um, if you have postures that have brows, that would help with some of your guts. I know your goats are gonna browse more than your sheep. Your sheep is gonna eat most of the grass, but if you keep the grass high enough, then the sheep will not eat all the way down to the six inches. And even so, you don't have to cut it all the way down to 12 inches because then your, your sheep don't have to eat all the way down. Um, if you have taller plants, that is better for your goats because then the parasite don't get all the way up. Um, however, the lower it is, the easier it is for it to be transmitted because it just has a short window to go up or a short area to go up the blades of grass for the animals to consume it. Um, and they do not survive well again on other surfaces. So if it's not grass, if you're giving your animal forage as in um, like they're out in the forest, they're, and they're not eating on the ground, a lot of times they don't have as much of an impact because they're eating high off the ground, so they're not consuming the parasite. However, you can't automatically say all your goats and sheep are going to eat high off the ground because if there's grass, they're going to eat it. So if there's any type of grass or, or forage low to the ground, they're going to still consume some of it. But they don't, con especially goats, don't consume as much if you have them in um, weedy, weeded areas or um, more of a browse than, than um, grass. So this table kind of tells you what the parasite does, right? So this is giving you a, um, just what will happen in loss of blood per day. So you have one worm or 50 worms will take about 2.5 mil of blood per day. While if you have 1,600 worms, you're going to have, have a loss of like 80 mils per day. Remember, you can have upward this 1,600 worms inside the animal. Um, and if you have more than that, then that becomes problematic. The males are naturally smaller than the females. So what you're seeing in this image are images of females. So you can see the females clearly on this image. And what it is, is the blood within the female that you're seeing. You can identify the female readily um, by looking at that. Now, mechanisms to limit resistance. So antelminthic resistance is a big problem. And that is a problem because of the utilization of the drugs that were available. Um, people ut utilize the three classes of drugs um, in ways that they shouldn't have utilized the, the, the drug classes. So what happened is that people dewormed on a regular basis. Some people will deworm every month, some people deworm every two months, while that is not that should not be the case. Another thing that people utilize is they will deworm without looking at um, weighing the animal. If you're not weighing your animal and you're deworming, then you'll run into issues with your animals because what happens next, your animal may be underdosed. And if your animal is underdosed, that only gives the parasite enough drug for them to get used to the drug. And then once they're used to the drug, what is going to happen? They become resistant and then the drug is no longer effective. So in order to prevent any type of um, resistance and in order to manage the parasites on your farm, the best thing to do is come up with effective management plans. 
So you come up with effective management plan. One of those is the use of Formarcha. So you can use the Formarcha system, which is a target, target selected treatment method, where once you do the Formarcha scoring and the animal has a Formarcha of a five, a four or a five, you deworm that animal. When the animal has a formatcher of one or two, you do not deworm that animal. That will cause those animals to have refugia. So that means they'll have parasites that was never exposed to the, the drug and therefore can still be susceptible to the drug that you have of choice on the farm. Now, with sheep and goats, if you have a goat that is a three and it has bad body condition, you normally would deworm it. If it's a lamb or if it's a kid, normally when it has a body condition score of a three, or not a body condition, but a formatcha score of a three, what you'll notice is that you will see the formatcha score. You'll see that the animal may have a bad body condition. And if it does have a bad body condition, then definitely you have to deworm. Um, then you have the five-point check. The five-point check is more recent. With the Formacha score, the Formacha score is done to only um, help you identify animals that have Hemonchus contortus infection. Now, the five-point check is done because that can account for other parasites as well. So you're, you're not just looking at the eyelid or the, in, the inner membrane. You're looking at more than just the inner membrane, which is going to allow you to see more than um, the more, more parasite impacts on these animals. So what you'd look for, you look for, um, you still do the formatcha. So that's the eye check. Then you can check the back. So you're going to do body condition. You want to see what the body looks like. Then you can look at the tail, which is the dog score. So if the animal has diarrhea, you'll see it on the butt. You'll see it on the tail. And if, if you see diarrhea and there is a bad formata and there is other issues, then you can deworm your animals based on that. Now, with sheep, a lot of time, what you'll do, you'll look at their nose to see if they have any type of um, runny nose. If the nostril is clogged up, um, you want to look at that. That could be nasal bots with um, lungworm. Or you, and you look at the jaw to see if they have bot, um, bottle jaw, like I showed you in a previous picture. With goats, the difference between the two is that sheep, you look at their nose for nasal droppings or how their nasal cavity is looking. While with goats, you're going to look at their hair coat. So you're going to see if the goats have rough hair cut. A lot of times they might have parasite issues. If it is tied in with something else, you see what multiple of these um, problems and then you know for sure you got a deworm. Now, there are only three classes of dewormers that are available in the United States. All the other dewormers are available in European countries or in like Australia and New Zealand. So they're not available in the United States. The majority is only available um, in, in other, well, all of them are available in other countries, but only three classes are available in the US. You have the benzimidazole class, which we call the white drenches. Um, then you have the, nicotina, the nicotinic agonists, which are um, gonna include things like levamasol, or Romantel. Then you have macrocyclic lactones, which is going to have like Ivomec or Moxidectin. Now, one thing to note is that not all these drugs are available for use in guts, but the majority of them are available for use in sheep. So when you buy some of these drugs, they're going to be in sheep dosage. And therefore, what you need to do is look at our deworming chart or calculate dub. some of them require double the dose when you're deworming goats versus when you're deworming sheep. Sheep dosages are smaller than goat dosages. And therefore, what needs to happen is that you'll need to 
deworm your goat with a higher dosage. And you can find the deworming chart. So the deworming chart is on the Wormix website. So wormix.info is where you'll find the deworming charts for both sheep and goats. Um, we recommend that you don't just utilize dewormers just because you feel like the animal needs deworming, but you actually use real sort resources to check if these animals require deworming and then you deworm accordingly. You deworm those that need it. You don't just deworm the entire herd. Now, because of resistance, what we have found is that um, combination deworming is actually more effective. And what we recommend a lot of time is that our farmers use combination deworming, which is going to kill more parasites um, than if you do um, a single dewormer. So the resistance that is available against one dewormer, occasionally what we'll do is use multiple dewormers. We'll use one, the most potent dewormer from each class of dewormers. So the three classes of dewormers, we use the most potent from each class and we deworm our animals that way. It helps to reduce the risk of resistance on a rapid basis, and it kills more of the parasites. So it's going to kill more than 95% of the parasites. However, you do have farms that currently has the um, resistance to all three classes of dewormers. And then that is where we're trying to come up with new ways or therapies to help um, these farmers that have that big of a problem. Now, as I said, one dewormer may not be effective. And therefore, two is going to kill more than one, and three is going to kill more than two. So that is what we are recommending. Um, you still do a FOMACHA score. You still use your FOMACHA system in order to check if your animal is anemic, and then you deworm based on that. Um, you treat with more than one dewormer, and it's going to kill the same type of worms, but it's going to kill more of the worms. Now, this table just kind of shows you an idea of what happens when you do combination deworming, right? And what is happening is when you use some dewormers, say you're using um, drug one, and drug one is 80% effective. Um, so drug one, when it's 80% effective, it's going to kill 80% of the worms. Drug two is 80% effective as well. It's going to kill 80% of the worms. But if you use both of these together, what you get is a combination that kills 90, 96% of the worms that is in that animal. Similarly, if you use three drugs from each different class, so again, if they're, the three of them are 90%, um, 80 percent effective, what you end up with is a 99.2% um, debt for the parasite. So with that, you don't leave enough parasite for, for an increase of resistance. While if you are deworming with drug one alone, that is 80% um, effective. The other 20% of the parasites are still going to get some of the drug, but they're not going to get enough that way is going to kill them. So what is going to happen is that those parasites are going to replicate or they're going to um, reproduce. When they reproduce, what happens is that their gene for resistance is going to replicate and then those parasites become a lot more resistant. So you're going to start increasing resistance to this one drug on your farm. With these, when you have combination and you're getting like 99% um, parasite death on your farm, there is only 0.8% um, parasite left in your animal that is going to develop some level of resistance. So that is not a lot of parasite. More than likely, it's a sub, a very minimal amount of parasite and therefore is going to take a longer time for the population of parasites to become resistant. And in that case, what will happen is that the parasites that are susceptible to the drugs are going to actually replicate more and those parasites are going to overthrow 
So pretty much you're going to have more of the susceptible parasite in your posture more than the resistant parasite. So the average parasite that is consumed by the gut is going to be susceptible. Another thing that you realize, even when the drug is becoming not very effective, even when that's the case and you still use a combination, you still end up with a higher um, percent of debt. So that is what you want to do. Again, this is just kind of telling you of what's the impact of combination deworming. And it shows you how effective it is when you kill parasites when you're using multiple drugs. So combination treatment is administered um, normally administer the complete dose of each dewormer, which is based on the animal's body weight. So you do not mix the drugs. So you don't get up and say, you know what? I have my three most um, potent drug from each class, the one from each class. I'm going to just throw them in a bottle all together, mix them up and utilize them. That is the no-no. So you don't mix them like that. What you do is you have a chart. You know how much you need to drench from each drug and you give them in their own individual syringes, deworming syringe like this one on the um, image, you're using your own individual deworming syringe and you're giving the drug individually. So that is what will happen. Then you can use selective treatment approach to maintain refugia. So once you're doing that, you select the animals that you need to deworm again, so you're using, even though you're using combination deworming, you're still going to select specific animals and deworm them there. Then you can give some supportive therapy. So while you're deworming your animals or taking care of your animals, you can go ahead and remove them from posture. You can um, limit the stressful environment for the animal give them like electrolytes. You can give them vitamin supplements, um, B vitamins. And I know there is a section that's going to go all the way through all these dewormers and it's going to tell you the most effective way. That's why I only brushed over it. I didn't really go into the details of how to deworm and what to deworm with because that is going to be covered. Um, but again, when you're deworming, you can give supplements to help your animal. You give your animal the best treatment possible when you're deworming so that they can recover, especially if they're in a bad state. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Um, there were a number of questions that, that um popped up in the chat during your talk. I um I attempted to answer as many as I could, um, but there's still a few left and um I will ask you um for those answers. So one person asked if there were any beneficial soil nematodes that could help with the barber pole worm control on pasture? Oh, sorry. Um, so nematodes, I'm not aware of any nematodes that they're using that are soil beneficial nematodes. Um, we only know of the fungus that we're using currently that is going to help to reduce the parasite in the fecal matter and then once it reduces the parasite in the fecal matter that will help to reduce overall parasite on the posture but as far as nematodes i'm not sure of any nematodes that is killing the parasite on the posture okay um thank you my answer to that was similar um another question was um I just answered this, but um, what are your thoughts on using um, fecal egg counts to monitor parasite, um, parasite egg counts and using that as a treatment guide? 
So I don't nor we don't normally recommend using the fecal egg counts to as a treatment guide. You can use it to know if your posture has a heavy infestation of parasites. Um, but you can't necessarily use it to say deworm an animal. And part of the reason for that is um, one animal may have a significant amount of eggs and is not showing any signs of um, the parasite giving any trouble. So it, the eggs that it might have as well might be eggs from other parasites when you're doing an egg count, depending on what was sent. Um, if you're doing it with a lab that tells you exactly what parasite it is, then that is a little bit different as far as knowing what is there. Um, you can tell with fecal egg count if your animals can be dewormed or, or if your dewormer is working or not working. But normally we don't necessarily use fecal egg counts to deworm our animals by itself. Yeah. Thank you. Um... You, you. I think you said you you said this during your talk, but if you could again, um, maybe address the the development um of any new antimintics or dewormers. Um, do you think any new ones? You mentioned that there are a number of new dewormers available in Europe, and there are also combination treatment dewormers that include more than one class of dewormers. Um, do you see any of these becoming available for use um, by sheep and goat producers in the US in the future? So from my perspective, I don't see them becoming a big thing in the US um, because um, one, the drugs that are available in Europe right now has already started showing resistance. Mm -hmm. So there's some level of resistance to those drugs already by the parasite. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I wouldn't see a need to push it to come to the U.S. if it's already showing resistance in those countries. However, mm -hmm. um, developing a new drug in the U.S. takes a very long time. And normally, they develop most of our drugs based on the cattle industry and not necessarily the sheep and goat industry. So... If the cattle industry is having severe resistant problem, then I can say for sure you're going to have a new drug soon. But if, since there is no really big resistance issue in the cattle industry, I don't see that being a, being a thing in the United States. And then combination deworming, we use mm -hmm. the classes that are available in the U.S., which would be um, the three classes that I put on the slide. And what we do normally is that we're going to, um, we recommend using the combination deworming with the most potent drugs of each class, which one would be valbazin, the other one would be moxidectin, and the mm -hmm. other one would be um, prohibit. Mm -hmm. So you use all three of them, but you use them according to their dosage. You don't mix them. Yeah, not mix it. And I think it's also important to note too, you, you, we, we talked about fecal egg counts and we talked about um, using combination treatment, but it's very important for, for farmers to, to um, know what drugs are still effective on their farm. Um, it's very important. Um, so if there is any way that you could get a fecal egg count reduction test done on individual drugs, because on some Farms. I know we mentioned that, or Dr. Matthews mentioned that dewormer resistance is prevalent. All the research shows this, but still, um, you might have parasites that might still be susceptible. So it's it's still important to to um, to to do fecal egg count reduction tests and see what drugs are effective or not. And, and most extension pers um, small rumen and specialists mm -hmm. in the area can help you to do some of that. So in the area you're in, there's a small rumen and specialist that can potentially help you to figure out your fecal egg count reduction test. Mm -hmm. um, someone had wanted to see the last slide again. I don't know if that person has left already, but maybe if you could bring it up again.
Okay, and then someone asked, um, can red cell be used while treating? So um, red cell, yes. Um, you don't want to use a lot. You want to use according to what's written on the bottle. Um, we have used red cell while treating. Um, and we treat first and give red cell after. And we don't give it every day. Mm -hmm. so there's, there's iron in it. And it's, it's going to help with the blood, red blood cells. So um, you can use it. And I, I will say, I will put in a plug. I'll put in the chat. I'm not sure how many people visit the website for the American Consortium of Small Women um, Women on Parasite Control. Um, but the website is simple. It's wormx.info. And that has a lot more information on all these topics, um, all these specific topics that Dr. Matthews went into. So if you want to read a little more, we can't get into it in one hour. This is such an important topic. Um, and so there's a lot of publications, videos, et cetera, on this website and current recommendations. Yes. So the next question is, what amount of time is good for pasture rest to allow parasites um, to die? So normally when you rotate pastures, um, you want to make it rest for about 60 days before putting the animals back on there. A lot of times too, um, like Dr. Brian and I have been to several meetings where they'll tell you that the parasites normally are still going to be there. It's just that it's going to be reduced. So there will be parasites leaving it, leaving it for 60 days in a rotation is better than doing 30 days because within the 30 day period, those eggs are going to be hatched and whatever eggs you left there can still, those um, L3s might still be on the pasture. So a 60 day rotation would be best. Okay. Um, Dr. Somebody asked what, oh, somebody before that, let me get to this. Do you have any comments on the use of high tannin feeds like bird's foot tree foil or coniferous trees to help with control? So yeah, condensed tannins. So condensed tannins, well, um, we've seen Cerisa lespedeza that um, help to work. Um, most of the, some of the condensed tannins does help um, with reducing the parasites, but also you gotta understand that condensed tannins can also impact your weight gain. So if it's fed too often or too long, then it reduces the weight um, and it re or reduces consumption, which then reduces weight. So that is, that is an impact. However, we've seen where condensed tannins do work. So they do work to reduce. So you, you rotate them into those areas where you're feeding condensed tannin for a while and then you pull them back off. Dr. Brian, you have anything to add to that? Um, I think you were pretty. As I mentioned, there are a lot of um we we on the Wormex that info website, there's a lot of um publications related to the use of, of forages with with um high with condensed tannins, um Celestidiza, especially. Um and so Again, just a lot of fact sheets and everything with more information on, on that yeah. specifically. Um, another question is for the red red cell. Do you have a recommended dosage? Um, so normally with our recommended dosage, I we normally use whatever the label says. So we normally don't do deworming until we read the label. So if we're going to give red cell, a lot of times we just look at the label at that moment, um, weigh our animals and give the same time we're doing the deworming. So based on the weight. Any specifics, Dr. Brian, that you have? No, I just, I'm just going by, we, we, we have hair sheep. And so we hardly have to deworm. Oh, yeah. 
Virginia State University. And just the one thing that pops up is a study that Dr. Nikki Whitley had done, and I think she had done like 30 mils, but I would have to check into that for the specific dose. Yes, I would have to look at that paper for her specific dose. Mm -hmm. And I think that anyone else has any burning questions for our speaker? Okay, I think that's it. So as I said, there will be, um, this will, the webinar series will be occurring every third Thursday. Um, so please join us. Um, I believe only the two first registrations are up. They're working on getting the others. Next month, we will have our webinar on um, record keeping and profitability. And our speaker will be Dr. Nikki Whitley from Fort Valley State University. That will be followed by Enterprise Budgets for Small Room and Production by Susan Shanian from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Um, those are the next two, so I hope you will join us for those. We do have one last question. What sheep breeds are most resistant? So for us, all the, um, we have used here sheep, and our here sheep has been very good for us. So Katahdin's, Dr. O'Brien has Barbados, Black Belly, as well as Dorpers. Um, those oh. are the ones that are working. St. Croix. St. Croix. St. Croix, yeah. St. Croix. Yeah. So those are the ones that work for us. And normally, those are the ones we see that are most resistant for us. Mm -hmm. So I'm, other... I'm in Belize. And in Belize, they actually told me that Katahdin's don't work here. <laughs> while in the U.S., the Katahdin's are doing great for me. Um, but here in Belize... They actually told me that they had um, a flock of Katahdin that, and all of them died from parasites. They said that? Yes. <laughs> so I, I went to a farm um, day, two days ago, and all of their Katahdins, they said, died from um, parasites. What they have now is Barbados black belly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are the most, St. Croix is considered to be like the most parasite resistant. Um, and Barbados, Black Belly, St. Croix, there might there are a few wool sheep, um, the Texels, some research earlier on indicated that Texels might have um, some natural resistance um, to parasites as well. Okay, so it is, um, yeah, right after eight. So again, thank you everyone for join, uh, joining us. If you have any burning questions, feel free to email myself or Dr. Matthews. Someone had asked, one of the participants had asked if we will share the, the presentation. The meeting, this webinar is recorded, so the presentation will be available on YouTube um, as soon as my marketing and communication um, department can get it up. Um, and I will ask Dr. Matthews to share the PDF of his PowerPoint, and I'll be sure to share that with everyone as well. All right, so thank you again, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Have a good evening, and I'll see you in a in a month. Thank you for having me, Dr. O'Brien. You Thanks are welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthews, for speaking today. Thank you.